Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for being here. Um, really pleased to be here and talking specifically about this particular topic of that I've chosen, um, which is the surprising road to reproduce. Well, at least it's surprising for me. Um, so I'm Prabhu, and I teach at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. Uh, been there for about 15 years. Um, this is the campus. We have a beautiful campus and an excellent academic environment. So I'm really grateful to IIT Bombay for giving me the freedom to do things that I like to do um, and do them well. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of my students. Um, on the left is uh, Pavan and on the right is Abhinav. Um, they're PhD students. They're finishing up. They're awesome students in case you're looking to hire someone. Um, so they've been using the tools that I've built um, pretty aggressively in the lab. Um, so big thanks to them. And they also helped me with getting some information about you know, reproducibility in various journals. I'll show you some soon. So thanks to them. So I've been basically doing research in numeric. So this talk is, uh, previous talk was awesome uh, in the sense that it talked about global data sets and being able to use them uh, but what I'm going to talk about is really something that's um, uh, what a typical numerical scientist, numerics, someone who does numerics would find. Um, and that's kind of what I do. I build tools to do particle-based uh, mechanics simulation. So either fluid mechanics or solid mechanics. Um, in particular, we use something called SPH right now. I used to do vortex methods earlier. Um, so I also build open source visualization tools. There's one called Mayavi. Um, and this is a viewer that's implemented as part of our PySPH framework, which is also open source. Um, so basically I work in numerical method. Um, I also dabble a little bit with ML and AI for PDEs, and this is some recent work for interpretable AI for PDE. All right, so the background for this backdrop really for this talk is really this very famous quotation about you know, what, an, what a, uh, an article about computer science, computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself, merely the advertising of the scholarship. Um, so I often like to quote this when someone says, I have a paper here. I like to tell them that, hey, you know, that's just advertising. Uh, the real scholarship is in the complete sco software development environment and the complete set of instructions which generated the figure. It's a very famous quotation, kind of the backdrop of this whole uh, talk. So the, the background really is, if you look at numerical research, um, most numerical methods research papers will require a heck of a lot of computation. And it varies from, you know, uh, computations that require hours and hours on a supercomputer to something that requires moderate amount of computing, but not something that completes, completes in like a few minutes or a few seconds, probably order of days. Um, and the second major issue backdrop is the fact that if you read a numerical research methods paper, um, we all make these mistakes. I'm not saying that I am somehow above these. We all make these mistakes. There are typos, right? Uh, so you're trying to reproduce someone else's paper and the equation is actually wrong. Happens a lot. Um, how many of you have seen one of these? Raise your hands. Okay, great. Okay, how many of you have seen missing uh, parameters or actually wrong parameters in a paper? Raise your hands. Awesome. Okay, great. So I'm not alone here. Um, the other issue often you'll find is they don't even cite the paper, the, the software that they're using. Many publications, actual publications, in top-notch journals. And then, of course, we have the review process, our favorite topic that we like to uh, complain about. Um, totally imbalanced power dynamic, um, lack of quality control. Um, and I think in about 20 or 30 odd reviews in the last five years, for papers that are fully reproducible, not one single reviewer actually commented about the fact that we have our code available and every figure is reproduced. Not one. And that speaks to what the problem is, the real serious problem. So anyway, what are we looking at? What we're looking at is, given a paper, this is basically the backdrop of what we're trying to do here. Um, given a paper, can one reproduce all the results easily without the author? Um, and this may well apply to oneself, an author, after five years, five months, or a year, or something like that. This is hard. So even if we don't go for this rather lofty goal, can you reproduce your own paper or results, or say that to a colleagues or a students or someone in your lab after a year? It's again not that easy. Or can you reproduce the colleague's paper in the same research area? See, clearly there are different areas. So if you ask me to reproduce computational results in a, a say, quantum mechanic, I don't think I'll be able to do it simply because I have no background. Um, so even this modern, modest goal is kind of hard to achieve. So what's the deal? So we all know that reproducibility is important. 
right? So we know it's the right thing to do. So the moral imperatives are very clear here. We all know that it's something we have to do. So how well is it really doing, right? We've known this for a long time. Science is based on this, but how well do we do? So as just a casual search, um, this is not really proper data analysis. But I've been looking at journals um, that we submit papers to or we read papers from. Uh, so I've picked some which are not, these are not trivial journals. They all have impact factors that are pretty reasonable from the engineering community, like three plus things like that. Um, so if you look on the left, there's like the journal name, the volume specifically, the total number of papers, whether they mention any software that they're using or not. And finally, are they reproducible? And reproducibility, I mean, at least close to the ideal that we want, that every figure that this, they've apparently shown in that paper can actually be reproduced by some script that exists somewhere. Right? That's, that's really what we're asking. And you'll find the numbers are really pathetic. And of the lot of these journals, the only one journal that's pretty reasonable and actually has a reasonable policy is the computer physics uh, communication. They actually have a, a requirement for some of their recent uh, editions where you're actually, uh, you're, you have to um, make a capsule available where you can actually reproduce. Uh, so it kind of forces it. That's one of the only notable exceptions in all of these. Numerics. And these are not, uh, the CMAME, for example, is I think the second highest impact. So this is, this is really a sad state of affairs. So what are the current drivers for reproducibility? Well, there aren't really many. Publication houses don't care. Most journals do not have a policy on reproducibility. And apart from computer physics communication that I talked about, the only notable exception, which is not really a numerics journal, is CISC. And I'm really happy to say that, you know, uh, someone from our community, Lorena Barba, big shout out to her because she's editor in chief. And I've actually seen the amount of effort she puts in in order to make things reproducible. That's the only lone exception that I've seen. And I, I agree, I've not seen all journals here. But especially in this domain, it's pretty bad, pretty bleak. So really big shout out to Lorena for, you know, uh, doing all that she does for uh, reproducible. Thank you. Really admirable. Um, all right. So with that sort of sad story, what really does matter to researchers? Clearly, our messaging saying that, you know, reproducibility matters a lot, you got to do it, it's the right thing to do, none of that seems to work, right? What really does matter is the fact that if I'm a researcher and I'm looking to publish, I need to, you know, do large parameter sweeps, I'm going to have to make a bunch of runs, um, and uh, I, I'd like to reuse my code for uh, post-processing, I don't want to keep rewriting the same code over and over again, and I typically submit a paper and I get a response from reviewers say in six months and the reviewers are going to say, okay, change this, change that, do this, do that. I want to be able to respond to that quickly. Um, so the modest goal here is, can we address this? This is where we started. So in this context, I'm going to give you a story. This probably rings a bell for everyone here. So in 2015, my first PhD student uh, graduated. He was doing his postdoc um, in Israel and he gave, came up with an interesting idea. And now the tables were turned. I was the grad student. He was the one with the interesting idea. So I was like, okay, fine, I'm going to try and, you know, get this done. And I thought I'll sit and do a research paper. Um, and it turned out that this thing required, just to prove the point that this scheme was decent and stuff, required about 70 plus simulations. Uh, and about five plus days of computation on a quad-core desktop, which is something that most people will laugh at, but it's not a small amount of computation. Um, so the issues for me were just running those cases a lot of work, because I got to keep track of all of them. Um, I need either manually produce figures or whatever for the manuscript. Um, and then, of course, dealing with reviews. And this paper had a horror story of two years through various reviews, doing all kinds of things. Um, but basically, you'll submit a paper, four months later or eight months later, you'll get a response. And now I have no clue what I did before. Okay? So these are issues. And I was juggling all kinds of other responsibilities as a faculty. So a typical story for, you know, a, a faculty member who's trying to push some research. So as part of this, I built this tool called Automan. Um, so the name comes from an old serial. If you don't know about it, forget about it. But uh, it's a very forgettable serial, but the name is Automan. Um, it's open source. And what does it do? It helps you organize your simulations. It helps you orchestrate running simulations and do post-processing. Helps you reuse code for post-processing. And it really helps you generate all your simulations and figures with one command. And icing on top of this is the fact that if you have additional computational resources, you can distribute your jobs pretty seamlessly to other computers. So the requirements for this package to work, um, again, I'm just kind of summarizing what we've done here. Um, and we arrived at these sort of requirements. It turns out that you just need three things to, to be able to utilize such a framework. The first is you need your code, whatever you're trying to run and automate, 
um, to be configurable using command line arguments. Now again, uh, one context that a lot of people have is, let's say you just have all of your code as just pure Python functions, then the problem is much easier to solve. Right? Uh, the problem that we have here is that our simulations usually take days to run. So it's not something that, you know, you can't just say, fire it upon a Jupyter notebook, run the Jupyter notebook, you're done. That's not enough in our case. So we typically have, um, um, you know, programs that you need to run. So you want them to be co configurable using command line uh, arguments. The second requirement is that the program that generates output, so all of these are fairly long running and they generate output. And the idea is they're going to dump that output in a directory. That directory needs to be configurable on the command line, second requirement. The third requirement is if you're doing any post-processing from your, from your code, um, instead of just producing the plots, you actually produce the metadata that produced the plot and save that out. These are the only three requirements. It's pretty straightforward standard requirements, right? Pretty commonsensical thing. And the instant you do that, you can actually use leverage our system. And so how it works is you write a little automate.py. Well, it's not little. Some papers, it can be 2,000 lines long. But it has all of your post-processing code. So all of your plotting code is there. All the simulations that you are asking for will be there. And you specify your simulations that you want to run in terms of what are called problems. I'll, I'll, I'll pick a specific problem today and show you a demonstration. Um, and then you just run python automate.py. It goes, runs all of your simulations for you. It schedules them if you have additional resources you've put in. Um, it will dump the figures after doing all the post-processing for you into a manuscript directory. And then hopefully if you've written your manuscript well enough, you just do PDF LaTeX or MK LaTeX and you're done. You have your paper. So the model that we have is you just work, have one piece, kind of like a make file, um, but it takes care of all of the dirty work for you. It does all of the processing. It schedules stuff for you. All of that it takes care of. So this is, this is the kind of workflow. So what I'm going to pick now as a demonstration is a simple example. And I'm going to use PySPH as a sort of black box. I'm going to run a fluid mechanics problem, simple one. I'm going to run a tiny problem. Don't worry, it's not going to take a day to finish this. Um, and I'm going to be running this particular command. So I'll just quickly do that. So that's the command. If I run it, um, so basically this command says run the Taylor Green problem, which has an exact solution in Navier-Stokes, uh, of the Navier-Stokes equations in two dimensions. Um, run it on as many threads as it can find. Uh, run it for so much time. That's the minus TF. I've reduced the time just to make sure it runs. Um, use 20 cross 20 particles and run it for a Reynolds number of 100. That's, that's all I'm saying. Um, so if you look at this output, it generates Taylor Green output, which has a bunch of plots, has a bunch of data stored as HDF file. And it also has this results.npz that you see here. Um, that has all the data for making the plots that I've already made. So if you want to look at one of these. Uh, so that's a plot that it made for this uh, silly uh, example. Um, but that's really what it does. There are other tools that let me visualize it and stuff like that. But that's kind of besides the point here. So what I want to do now is I want to do a parameter sweep. I want to run this for different resolutions, say NX is 10, 20, 30. Usually I'll pick much larger numbers, but I'll take forever to run. And I want to run it for two Reynolds numbers. That is also something that probably you may want to change a lot. So I'm just picking six cases that I would like to automate. So how does the system work? So the automate.py basically does the following. The user just specifies a bunch of problems that they want to solve, um, and then specifies two directories. One for all your software output that goes generated, the simulation outputs. And the other is your manuscript folder where you want to dump your figures. Okay? Um, and then internally, it has a task scheduler and a, you know, a, a, a task runner and a scheduler, which takes care of executing the jobs in the right order and stuff like that. But that's an internal detail. Um, so as I said, you have like two output directories. You mark these. Um, and then you break up your little pro your problems into a set of problems. Right? Um, and each problem basically may have itself several simulations, each generating multiple outputs. And usually what you're looking to do is, you know, you, you run a simulation, you run another simulation, um, you run three of these, and then you want to say, okay, across these, what's happening to some result, right? So that's your post-processing. So what you want the system to do is run all these simulations for me, wait. Once all of them finish, execute some post-processing. And usually that post-processing is not very time-consuming. Could be sometimes, but in this case, it's not. Um, and that generates the content for the manuscript. That's, that's really how the problem structured. Um, so, well, I'm going to skip this. Basically, we have some simulation instances which sort of tell us what the simulation, uh, what are the parameters for the simulation. This helps us filter out, you know, saying, I want all cases which have a Reynolds number of 100. I want all cases which have a Reynolds number of 200. Right? I can filter those and then do some plotting. For them. So the idea is we try to pass as much metadata that we have, that you know, 
Um, and the, the, the tooling in infrastructure makes it easy to go between those options that you provide and the command line algorithm. So that's kind of transparent to the user. So all you need to do is say, I have these options and I want to use these options. All right, um, so now comes the bigger question is, so that's all fine. I don't want to sit and write 300 simulations as, you know, simulation, simulations. You want to be able to just, you know, generate these. And it turns out it's fairly straightforward to do. Uh, we have a couple of small utilities here. So let's say we have a current case, uh, we have a smaller situation. I have two resolutions, NX is 10, NX is 20, and Reynolds number is 100 and 200. Now, if I want to say, I want to get four runs from this, um, if you just do mdict nx is a list of this and this, re is a list of 100 and 200. And if I look at this, I immediately get a list of dictionaries. And so what we can do now is use each of those dictionaries as keyword arguments to a function which will generate whatever we need to generate. Does it make sense? So the, uh, the approach just builds on this. And now sometimes you have situations where you have like, uh, um, uh, you know, like for example, take the Atom Optimizer. It requires a learning rate that's very different from say uh, LBFGF. So if you have something like this and you want to again do a, uh, you know, you want to take the product of this and the number of cases, if you had something like this, again, all you need to do is, you know, generate this and you generate a product of these two, you get 16 runs. So in like four lines of code, it's super easy to just, you know, generate a set of parameters that you want to sweep over. And this is very common in a lot of our situations, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not too hard to, uh, to really do. But the bigger problem is, you know, if you go back, we have a simulation and the simulation has to be dumped in a specific directory. And we're always scratching our heads trying to say, okay, you know what the simulation directory is, what it should be. So we have a simple uh, way to, you know, generate a, a unique directory from all of these options. And so that's also, a tool. Um, so that's also available. So I'm just going to quickly show you uh, a simple um, first cut that we have. Uh, we have a bunch of imports. I hope the font is visible at the back. Okay. Great. So we have a bunch of simple imports. We say uh, problem, automator, simulation, mdict, and ops to path. That's all I need. And I'm saying, look, I want to run this command. That's the base command. Um, that's the output directory. That output directory is automatically generated for us. And then I say, look, create a bunch of options here. That's just the product of these. That gives me six cases straight away. Okay. A single line for that. And then I say, generate all the simulation cases that I want. That's a simple, uh, you know, uh, this comprehension. So I just create uh, 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 for each simulation, the output should go into an unique directory that's based on the options that's given. Um, and then I specify, so in this case, this is a job that requires OpenMP. And with OpenMP, I may require so many threads and so many you know, cores that it's going to actually use, and I can specify that here. Um, give it the command, and also give it keyword arguments. And the keyword arguments are generated from this set of dictionary. And that's it. So this becomes a set of cases. And then after this job is finished, it will run this code. And right now, all it does is it makes an output directory. So there are no figures being generated yet. I just want to show you how it, you can just set up these simulations. And then finally, we have an automator, which is given the set of output directories, um, the set of manuscript, the, uh, where you want manuscript output stuff to go, and the set of problems that you want to solve. That's a list of problem in, uh, classes. And then you run it, and that's it. So now let's run this. So if I do minus H, it has a standard command line interface. But if I just run it, it's basically going to run all of these six jobs on my machine. Right now, I don't have anything else set up. Um, it's going to wait for things to finish, depending on how many cores are currently being used. These are pretty quick, so it'll take like, uh, uh, like a minute to finish. And then we'll finish all of the tasks, do any post-processing, and we're done. So that's kind of how it works. I'll let it finish. Um, so next task is once your simulations have finished, we want to be able to make plots. Um, to do that, we have some very convenient utilities. So let's say I want to plot for all the Reynolds number 100 case. I want to plot something which shows a comparison of some, something. Right? So you can filter cases super easily um, you know, by just giving filter cases, passing it, whatever parameters that you've already given. And this is a big win because we've explicitly asked the user to give us parameters. So now I can filter based on the same parameter. Um, and then if I want to compare these runs, there's another convenience function. You can give it a single plot function, which will plot the same thing with different line styles. Um, and then again, it just uses the same infrastructure because you already have the metadata. You know where all the files are. And you know it's just small bits of code that allow you to make plots. 
So I'll just show you the next version of this. So it's finished running all my cases. So let's look at automate two. And now I just have these additional lines, some NumPy imports, um, filtering the cases, comparing the runs. This setup is exactly the same. The only thing that's changed is I've added a, added a couple of plotting functions, which just you know read the data file that we have, make a plot, make an exact solution plot. Another one that just makes, so it's just one line each for these plots. And then here I just filter all the RE100 cases, compare them using these plots, and then the rest of it is just straight out matplotlib code, right? Just legends, show me the titles and stuff like that. Typically, this is what you'd like to do for a manuscript. And the key here is when you save the figure, each problem has a problem-specific output directory where it dumps the stuff. So that's about it for a single problem. And so now if I were to run um, Python automate 1.py, it's going to say it's not done anything because it's already created the output directory in the past. So if I say minus F, it will not rerun my simulations, but it'll only rerun the post-processing, which is usually a small, uh, small amount of time. But now it's finished. And now let me look at my manuscript figures uh, folder. It has this scipy directory uh, and the folder is empty. Oh. oh, I ran the wrong automation. Okay, automate two is what I should have run, sorry. Didn't do any plotting in that. I had two separate files. Okay, so now it's finished. And if I open this, um, we have scipy and we have our Reynolds number comparison. That's a plot, right? So it's pretty straight, uh, you know, relatively straightforward to do this. Ah. Okay, so I had a slightly extended demo where I could show you, you know, you can easily add another parameter. So if I say I want one more case to be run, another Reynolds number, I just change that one thing there and it'll do the rest of the work for me. It's kind of it's automated at that point. Um, the other nice thing we can do is if you have another computer that's available on your network, it's relatively easy to set that up. Um, we also support virtual ends, Conda environments, and uh, EDM if you want to set up a remote. And it'll actually, um, depending on the availability, it'll submit jobs on the other machines. So based on this, we wrote a little paper in CISC, um, uh, which went through really well. In fact, they reproduced the paper results. Uh, that. Okay, so well, problem solved. Um, now we have a strategy with which we can completely automate. But so what? What? So uh, I thought maybe this is something that only I would like to do. So I've I kind of asked my students if they'd like to use this. And after five years, we have about a dozen automated papers. Like almost every paper that comes out from the lab is fully automated in the sense that every single figure in every one of our manuscripts is automated. Um, and everyone in the lab default by default automates. Um, it makes it much easier for them to incrementally do research because they just set up the automation and now they can forget about that case because they can always return to it. So it's much less stressful and it's super easy to make changes after the submission. Six months later, you can always go back, revisit um, and finish this. And, and even their exploration is you know, uh, driven by automation. And the researchers are hooked. So this is one of this is Pavan's recent quotation. So he had 760 simulations to make for one single paper. And he just tweeted, he was so excited. He just tweeted about it saying, I just did this and Automan made that possible. Um, so it makes a huge difference. So takeaways, okay, so of course. So seriously, um, preaching reproducibility does not work. Okay. Uh, it clearly hasn't done. But focusing on automation seems to work. And it looks like in my lab, at least, uh, the researchers just love it so much that they are willing to invest that extra time to get this done. And it also improves the quality of our research. And as a side benefit, we get reproduced. So with that, I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Um, and I hope you use the ideas that we've found here um, to increase reproducibility through automation. Thank you. That's a great question. So the question is, can I integrate this with an HPC task manager like Slurm or PBS? That's one of the highest priority items in our to-do list. Um, since that happens to be my to-do list, and I'm, I usually submit these on my own little cluster, 
I haven't had the time to do, do it, but it's been a long thing that I've, long pending thing that needs to be done. It is not supported, but I'm happy to take a pull request. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a very important feature we need to add. Um, the question is, how does this integrate with experiment tracking packages? I'm a oh, okay, like MLflow. I'm not too familiar with MLflow, so I, I, I can't quite answer that question directly. I mean, if you can elaborate a little bit, I can try and answer. Right? Oh, yes. So, yes, uh, I mean, it does. Uh, the question is, what if you want to persist artifacts from each of the runs and things like that? So yes, you can. Um, all of that is, in fact, if you don't have that, there's no way you can automate all of that. So we actually have uh, the ability to um, uh, have dependencies between tasks. It can be specified. It may not be the best, but it does, it does exist. So a lot of this has been driven based on our research. So it may not be 100% for everyone, but it's completely open source and feel free to use it. Um, I just one caveat is that I'm not kind of saying that Ottoman is the best way to do this. I'm just saying if you follow these principles, um, you could write your own, and we'd be very happy if you use Ottoman and extend it. So, not kind of advertising it as necessarily the solution for everything. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So the question is. There are a huge number of workflows, workflow systems. Uh, should the scientific community stand around one of them and you know, work to improve it? Absolutely, I think we should. But having said that, and having looked at the number of plotting libraries we have, I don't think that's more likely to happen. But yes, it'll be great if we had that. Uh, but it is true that there are many, many workflow solutions. Uh, we did look at a lot of those before we wrote Ottoman. None of them kind of fit the specific needs of the numerical research kind of environment, um, at least at the time that I looked at. So if you look at the paper, we actually survey a bunch of tools. I thought at the time the best one available was like NextFlow. Um, I don't know if the situation has changed now, but five years ago, NextFlow was really, really good. But the problem was it wasn't all Python. And I didn't want the you know, additional headache of dealing with another language or another, um, you know, uh, another domain specific language to deal with in order to do the schedule. This is all pure Python. All right, so looks like that's it in terms of questions. So if you have any more questions, you can feel free to um, email me or look me up on Slack um, or just bump into me somewhere and ask me questions. Thank you very much.